would love for you to come up closer if you feel so comfortable so we don't feel like it's an auditorium. Let's feel like a family that's about to have some fun together instead of like we're sitting in a faculty meeting and we really want to go home as soon as possible. I know that feeling because I'm the person in the back at every faculty meeting. My name is Laura McDonald, and just to kind of give you a background on who I am and where I come from in education, I am not an Iowa native. I was born in Texas. Uh, ended up in Missouri. Yeah. So I, I am black and gold. I run black and gold in my veins, but I'm sorry, it is not because of the Hawkeyes, which I've discovered is a region in Iowa. <laughs> Unless you live on the other side of the state, and it's, uh, what's the other one? You and I, oh, the Corn Huskers in Nebraska, of course. Isn't there a, um, a college that, it's like Iowa State? Iowa State, Iowa State yeah. I mean, no offense to anybody, I'm still learning, learning Iowa. This is my third year in Iowa, so um, we're, we're still learning the, the religions in Iowa, so to speak. Um, basically, I started teaching about 20 years ago, not to date myself, but that's where I started. Um, got my degree in elementary education and taught several years in second grade and in third grade and in fourth grade. Um, taught some combined classrooms at a very small school for a while. Had third and fourth grade combined in the same room and that was interesting and a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, about three years ago, I switched gears. I finished my Emens training, and I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with Emens, but basically it's a training uh, to, it's, it's a, about a three year process to learn how to integrate the technology into the classroom and kind of become an expert on, on that. And so I went ahead and finished simultaneously along with that training my master's degree in instructional technology and took a job with Rivermont Collegiate, which is in Bettendorf, Iowa in the Quad Cities. I don't know if any of you are from that side of the state. And I have been their technology integration specialist now for three years. And because we're a small private school and everybody wears many, 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 many hats, um, I'm also kind of um, helping in the IT department and teaching <laughs> kindergarten through seventh grade computer <laughs> science and helping with some of the after school technology clubs and kind of a late liaison between uh, Rivermont and the local colleges to kind of help get some engineering and some computing clubs going between the two. So I'm kind of bouncing all over the place all of the time. But I will say that my absolute favorite thing to do is teach, whether it is a kindergarten class or whether it is a group of faculty. It's just so much fun to come together and learn. And I will say that always as a teacher, and I, I know you feel the same way, I feel like I learn as much as what I am teaching. So definitely want this room to feel like you can share and jump in with ideas at any point because I love to learn too. What I'm here today to do is share with you my experience with teaching elementary students how to code. And I don't know if any of you have done that before or if this is like a brand new idea to you. So I just kind of want to get a feel for the room right now. How many of you have done any type of coding at all with your students? A few of you. Okay, so how many of you, this is a brand new and you're just trying to figure out if it is something that you could do, it's still kind of scary, is it valuable in the classroom? Those kinds of questions. Okay, and, and yes to all of those. When I started teaching coding three years ago, it was not because I am an expert at coding. When I did rudimentary coding in college originally, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago that was. You can probably tell by the gray hair, but I'm not going to tell you. It's different now. I mean, it's I, mean, I think about using, I, you know, I used DOS. That's how old I am. I used DOS. Um, I remember the old Commodore computers. I remember those original apples that all we did is play Lemonade Stand and Oregon Trail. Back when there were no pictures. <laughs> Just when it was all pixelated text, you know. So what I learned more than 20 years ago in terms of any programming a computer is completely different than the experience today. 
Therefore, three years ago, when I was asked to start working with programming with students, my initial reaction was abject fear. Because I remembered what it was like for me, and the way I was taught, and it was scary, and it was confusing, and it was way above my head. And I didn't know that I wanted to go there with elementary students. So at first, when I was asked by our IT person to explore this, I was a little resistant. Um, and then I thought, okay, we'll see how this goes. And we started it with the Hour of Code. How many people have heard of Hour of Code? Oh, wonderful. Are any of you going to participate this year? Please do, please do. I'll talk more about that when we get going here a little bit. But basically, I started with Hour of Code because they had all these pre-made activities, and I got on ahead of time, and I did the activities myself, and thought, this isn't hard. This is playing a video game. And the more I played with it, the more I realized how much I was learning about programming without necessarily realizing it. And that just kind of led to bigger and better things, which I'll kind of talk about as we go on. So, just to kind of start off with, we're going to talk about what coding is. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But basically, coding is the language of computers. It's the way in which we give computers directions so that they know what they are doing when we push a certain button or we type a certain word or we click here or we click there. The computer is not a human being, so it has to have a process. It has to have a list of directions of what to do in case of this, in case of this, in case of this, in case of this. So all those contingencies have to be programmed in ahead of time to the computer. So when we are teaching programming, Today, there are a variety of programming languages that can be used. Probably most of you are familiar a little bit with the term HTML, which is the language that we write web pages in. It, it's also used in other applications as well, but mainly when we think about HTML, we think about uh, creating web pages. And I'm going to tell you right now, my second and third graders use HTML and create web pages. Yes, it's possible. Yes, they have fun with it. Yes, they learned it faster than I did. So if you're sitting there going, hey, she's full of it. Trust me, I will show you. JavaScript is another one that my students in particularly kind of like. It's not my favorite, but they kind of like it. And that's great if they ever want to go on and, and make apps. Um, I have a few students that like to try Python, which is a very mathematical language. And those students that are very much math oriented kind of gravitate to that language. There are tons, there are way more than I could put up here on the screen for you. When we teach elementary students how to code, I'm not necessarily going to be teaching them any of these languages explicitly. But I am going to teach them the concepts of these languages exist just like languages that they learn in school, like Spanish or French or German. <coughs> learning to write a computer language uses all those same skills as learning a foreign language. What we are going to be doing in elementary is preparing them to give the computer directions, the critical thinking, the sequencing, the processing, which then, by the time they are in upper elementary, middle school, high school, they will be able to take what they have learned, those concepts, and pick up on a programming language so much more quickly, you know, the actual writing it from scratch. So why teach coding? I don't know how many of you have been on code.org, anybody? Okay, I'm gonna share a video from there that I really like. Oh, actually, you know what, I may not because it's gonna take us a, a lot of time and I don't think they've got the audio hooked up in here. Um, but I'm going to, I will link it to our resources. But there are some great videos on code.org that have some of the experts like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, from Facebook, uh, talking about why learning to program is so important in schools and why computer science in general is becoming so, so important. I mean, you can see just in your daily life, technology is everywhere. Can you imagine what it's going to be like 10 years from now? 
think about 10 years ago. Now fast track that 10 years in the future, 20 years in the future. Every day on the news, we hear about more and more that's happening in computer science. And whether we like it or not, technology is part of our world every day. It's going to increasingly become so. So there's some great um, videos from some experts. I'm going to put on my resource page on my live, live binder so you can see those. Um, one of the things that I found kind of interesting, there were a couple of articles that kind of summed up what I think about when I think about why I teach coding in the elementary, not just as a computer science course, but inside the classroom. You know, if you don't have the computer science class that your students go to, it's still a great thing to teach in the regular classroom. And we'll talk about some applications about how that reaches to um, all the other subject areas as well. Oops. Every time I, I switch between screens here, it bounces me off of the, uh, the duplicated screen. Isn't <laughs> that weird? So you can see my mouse and I can't see my mouse. That's fun. college and when they go out into the workforce that idea of sequencing and giving step-by-step -step directions and being able to communicate with the computer in such a way that even if you aren't the one writing the software you can run the software you can modify the software you can manipulate it to do what you specifically need it to do it's a skill that is much much needed idea about the future of what our children are going to be doing. This is from a year ago. This is the 25 hottest skills of 2014 according to uh, the LinkedIn site. How many of you use LinkedIn? A few of you. So LinkedIn is basically a site where all professionals can go on and create a profile and put what skills they have and they can connect with other people who are in that same type of business area. You can also look for um, job avenues through there and recruit through there. And they have this huge set of skills that you can list that you have. And other people can endorse you and say, yes, I can verify that that person has that skill. So when they look at the skill sets that are most sought after <coughs> by the business world today, by the job market, a year ago, these were their top 25. And I'm not going to go through all of those. But I do want to point out to you that of those 25, 17 of those require a basic understanding of coding. 
even if you're not the person who's actually going to be writing the program, having that basic understanding of how it works applies to 17 of those top 25 job skills that employers are looking for today. Now, if you think about um, five years from now, it's probably going to be closer to all 25 of those. So that's thinking down the road as far as where our children are going. And as educators, what is our job? Our end goal is to prepare them to go out and be successful, productive citizens in the world. You know, we love them, they are our children, we want to nurture them, um, you know, treat each individual child and make them know that they're valued. We also have to keep in mind that our end goal is we want them to be successful in life as far as their career choice. And if this is what is going on right now in the job market, if you think about five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road, this is an essential skill that students need to know. And unfortunately, it's not taught in very many schools. And I know you're sitting there thinking the same thing that I was three years ago. You're thinking, how do we fit another thing into our day, into our curriculum? This is one more thing on top of all of the other things I've been asked to teach. Where do we fit this in? Where's the value here? How important is it really? And I'm going to tell you that I have discovered that it is immensely valuable, not just in the computer science classroom, but the students that I've been working with for the past three years are showing growth in all their other subject areas. And I did not know this till about a year ago when teachers started coming to me saying, will you teach more coding in computer science? And I said, well, Sure, they love to code, but you know, what is your reason for asking me that? And over and over and over again I hear, because they are learning skills there that they are transferring into math. They are transferring into their writing. They are transferring into their critical thinking and their comprehension and reading. And it took me a while, when I walked into the classrooms and I just started watching what they were doing, I could see those connections being made from what they were doing in programming to everything else that they were doing. It was making more sense to them. You know how a child can sit down and play a video game and pick it up instantly, even though it's very complicated? And if you and I sat down to try to play that same video game, never having looked at it before, we'd have to spend the first day just learning how to manipulate it and what the rules are. Students pick up, that, that's the way their brains are wired now. They have they've been born into technology. And so those things are very natural for them. That's the way their brain processes. And so coding makes sense to these young children. And with, when they can go into another subject and go, oh, so what you're saying is it's just like when I do this in my programming. It makes sense, it clicks. And we'll talk some more about that. I found this a, a, an interesting graphic. I got this off of code.org, and they have lots and lots and lots of infographics to give you an idea of why this is so important. But this is one that kind of stands out to me as a technology integrationist, is that we have projected by the year 2020, five years away, that there will be 1.4 million computing jobs available but only 400,000 computer science students to fill them. Not that I think every child needs to go into the field of computer science, but when you take this and you look at those top skills needed by employers listed on LinkedIn, even if they are not going out into the computer science field per se, the understanding of how software works, of how a computer works, of how to manipulate programming, just the basic understanding of that is going to be helpful in so many job areas that they could go into, even if it's not this particular strand. So the question is how to get started, and that's probably why a lot of you are here today. Okay, I'm interested, I may or may not have bought into the value of it yet, but what do I do with my elementary students to get them going? 
The very first place I would recommend you go if you haven't already is code.org. It is a wonderful website. It is absolutely free and has wonderful games for your kids to play with. And for a while, they're not going to realize that they're learning how to program until you start pointing it out to them. Did anybody go yesterday to the Code Studio workshop? Oh, good. I get to tell you about it then. Yay! I'm so excited about that. I'm going to see if this works this time. If I click on it. so we can start playing with them ourselves. <coughs> okay, so this is what the coach.org website looks like. And there are a lot of different uh, computer and software companies that go together to work on code.org. And they've kind of collaborated on this and created it specifically for kids to learn how to code and made it very classroom friendly. <coughs> I'm going to go to the Learn tab, and you're welcome. If you have your devices out and you want to do this with me, please go right ahead. Go to code.org. I'm going to the Learn tab, and one of the things underneath the Learn tab is Hour of Code. An Hour of Code is a project that started maybe about five years ago, I'm not sure if it's been quite that long, um, in which for a week in December during Computer Science Education Week, I believe it's the second week of December, all students across the world are challenged to spend one hour learning how to code. And they've created all these wonderful games and tutorials on here so students can just go in and do it completely by themselves. And they have everything from kindergarten level, all the way up to upper school, high school, if you wanted to do it that way. So if you have not done this yet, I would suggest that if you want to kick off some coding in your classroom, or go back and, and show your teachers a way to kick off coding, the very first thing I would ask you to do is go to code.org and go to the Hour of Code and register to participate in that. And I think when the, every year they give you some, some freebie storage space somewhere for signing up to host that. It's like an extra 10 gig of Dropbox space, or I think uh, last year one of the options was um, some Skype credit. So you do get a little perk for signing up to host the Hour of Code. Another thing that they have underneath there is called Code Studio. If you have not been to a Code Studio workshop, or if you, if you have not heard of a Code Studio work workshop at your local AEA, I would strongly suggest that you contact your AEA and say, hey, when are you hosting the next Code Studio workshop? Code Studio is curriculum for you to teach code with. It's awesome. When I went to the workshop, I kind of already knew a lot of the the games and the tutorials they had on code.org, but Code Studio refines it into lessons. And some of the lessons are plugged, meaning they use the computer, and some of those lessons are unplugged, in which you're learning concepts, but you're not actually using the technology to do it. You might be doing um, an exercise where everybody's up and moving, and they're simulating something in regards to programming, or you're playing a card game that teaches a concept in programming. So Code Studio is a great curriculum. They have courses one through five available right now. I teach course one to my kindergarten, first and second grade students. Course two, second grade is kind of my crossover year, so if they finish course one, I start them in course two. <coughs> um, I do course two with my second and third graders and my fourth graders, but then I try to get them through it quickly. In course three, I start with my fourth, fifth, and sixth grade on up. My middle school students that I teach, I actually do go ahead and start them in course two. And I know that sounds really low because that's what my second and third graders were doing, but 
I, I don't know about your school, but in my school, my middle school students have never done anything with coding or programming either. They've got to have a place to start. And honestly, they love doing those activities. I was just telling someone earlier that my middle school students take longer to do the course than my elementary students. And that is because elementary students are still young enough. They take everything at face value. They don't overthink things. They're not overanalyzing things and making mistakes because of it. My middle school children, they're overthinking. They're thinking programming. This, it must be harder. It can't be this simple. And so they do too many steps, or they, they overcomplicate the program, and then they, they run into some trouble. And so my middle school students actually have a rougher time with it than my elementary students. But it's a place for them to start, and they love to do it. They think it's a lot of fun. And then they can move on and up into those courses four and five very quickly then and take that on to the next level in middle school and upper school. And probably here under local classes, I haven't checked out that link, but possibly under local classes, you might be able to find where some of those workshops are held. Although I know that they do have a representative here in Iowa that goes to every single AEA every year and offers a workshop. So check yours out. It is a great workshop. You will not regret going to it. It's a lot of fun and you learn a lot about teaching programming. I'm going to go to the Hour of Code. And here's right here with the bumblebees where you can sign up if you want to host an hour of code. And they will help you. They, they will show you step by step what to do, what the activities are. Uh, they will give you tips. They will send you free posters to hang up to advertise it. It's a wonderful, wonderful program. But here under hour of code, we have all these different activities that you can use. And I'm going to tell you that I do not just use them for Hour of Code. These are here all the time. They're always being added to. They are always free. So I use this page all year long with my students, not just during the Hour of Code. We tend to use that Computer Science Education Week as a kickoff <coughs> for coding for the year to kind of get them revved up and excited and kind of make it you know, a little contest between them and themselves and them and their peers. And then we continue to use this. So, I'm going to go to the first one that I worked with with students, and it happens to be their favorite. Now, I'm very old school, so I, I'm not overly familiar with Angry Birds as a game itself, but Angry Birds seems to be what all the kids, including middle school, loves to work with. So if you are there, go ahead and go with me. I'm going to go ahead and click on the go button. And I want you to notice that at the top, in the green bar, it says Hour of Code, and then right now there's a one in a circle, but then there's all those dots following it. Those are the activities. So as they complete activity one successfully, it will be filled in green, and then they go to activity two, and activity three, and activity four, and their progress bar keeps filling in. <coughs> also, as what you're seeing right here, before every new concept that's introduced, there's going to be a short little 30 second video that the students watch in which some of these big corporate giants in the computer science field are actually talking to them about this particular skill. For example, they, they might be explaining to them the concept of making, making your character move forward or turn. Or they might be explaining the concept of the repeat button. Instead of writing to do this and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again and do it again, it teaches them how to, to repeat an action a certain number of times. So every time a new concept is introduced, there's a little video explaining to them how to do it, which I love. It helped me when I went through it and did it the first time. So once the video, their little video is open or done, then they get a prompt that explains to them what the puzzle is. Now, what I do for my kindergarten and first grade, I don't do it so much now with my second grade because they've done this a couple of times, but I believe the first year I also did this with second grade. We actually had this up on a screen like we do in here. 
and we did it together. And then after we did it together, I sent them back to their seats and they did it again on their own. And I know that may seem very redundant and overly easy, but it's not. They're, they're still going to struggle and need your help and go, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. So I want you to watch as we go through a couple of these exercises, and I want you to think not just about the computer programming piece of it, but how what they're doing is applicable in a lot of other situations in the classroom and in life. So it says, can you help me catch the naughty pig, stack a couple of move forward blocks together, and press run to help me get there? So what the students don't know that you are going to know is they are building an algorithm. And an algorithm is just a set of directions. They're building an algorithm, and then later they will put those algorithms together to build a program. So here they have when run, meaning when I start this algorithm, I want the angry bird to move forward. Now, if he moves forward one block, is he going to be at the pig? No. So he needs to move forward again. And then we're going to hit run to see if that worked. And it makes fun little noises that they've got their headphones on. They, they absolutely love this. And this I love. This is where it pulls it in and kind of shows the kids you're learning how to code here. So you just wrote two lines of code. Now when you think about writing code, this is probably not what you thought of. You probably thought of having to write like an HTML language or JavaScript language. The kids will get there on down the road, but that's not how we start in elementary. We start with these drag and drop type of programs to just get the sequencing down. How to, how to do the different concepts. I'm going to skip forward a few lessons on this. Because the first couple are basically just moving in a straight line. Okay, so in this puzzle, we have to get Angry Bird to the pig. So when we run, we want it to do what? And here are, the, here are the command choices we have. We can move forward, we can turn left, or we can turn right. Anybody in here teach kindergarten? What are you thinking right now? <laughs> they don't know they're left and right yet, do they? So I'm going to show you how I, how I do this with the students. So pretend you are the students right now, and I say, okay kids, we have to get Angry Bird to the pig. What's the very first thing Angry Bird has to do? What are the kids going to say? They're going to say, move down. And I'll say, but move down isn't one of our choices. We can, we can move forward, we can turn left, or we can turn right. But we've got to move down. So that's when I start demonstrating to them, okay, Angry Bird is facing this way. So I stand here, just like this, facing this way. If Angry Bird is facing this way, and he moves forward, what would happen? What's Angry Bird going to do? He's going to run right into the TNT, and this is where I explain to the kids that TNT is dynamite, and they go, I know. <laughs> So moving forward is not an option. He's, he's going to hit that dynamite if he moves forward. And I don't have a move to the side choice. Hmm. However, if I can figure out a way to get Angry Bird to turn so that he's facing this way, then he can step forward. And this is where with my kindergarten and even first grade, we start talking about left and right, and that concept of, okay, we're going to learn that if we go this way, that's right, and if we go this way, that's left, and we start doing, you know, the L's and all those things that you do with, with kindergartners when you're teaching them left and right. And so right off the bat, they're starting to get some of this directional wording. And so once we understand that, okay, he's got to turn this way, and then I help them and say, okay, that would be a right turn. So which of those blocks do we need? Turn right. But just because he turned his body doesn't mean he really went anywhere. 
He just turned. So then I asked the kids, so then what does he need to do? If he's going to go here, he's got to step there. So, so far, so far we've made a turn, and once we've turned, then we can go forward, because forward is in front of us. That's a directional word. So then we work the students through, I turn right, and then I step forward, but I can't keep going forward because there are blocks there. So now the students are starting to go, oh yeah, I can't just slide, that's not one of my choices. So I've got to turn again, and at this point, the students are up with me. They're standing up, they're doing this with their bodies too. So we've got to turn this way, and I tell them that's a left turn. And then once you're facing that way, then there's a path in front of you so you can go forward. You kind of get the idea of how this works with elementary students, trying to explain it to them. And so as, we're, as we are talking that through as a class, that's when we're putting our blocks together. And I'll do it right there on the board. So we said we'd move forward, and then we would turn left. One, two, three times. And then the students start getting excited because they're like, oh, I think we can get to the big. <laughs> we'll see if that works. I did that quickly. And those little ones at this point are just buzzing with excitement. Is he going to get to the big? And then when he does, they get so excited because they feel like they've accomplished it. They did it. They wrote the eight lines of code. And I make sure that I'm telling them, look what you did. That is amazing. You just wrote an algorithm. You just wrote a set of directions. Kids, did you know that there are people a lot older than you who don't know how to do that? And then they get really even more excited. Then it's like, oh, they are the smartest kids on the face of the planet. And I want them to feel that way. This is tons of fun. OK, so that was, you know, that was kind of simple. I'm going to move forward. I'll go to this one. So by the time they get up into these higher levels on Angry Birds, they have learned how to use a repeat block. And that is when they have this pink block that's called repeat. And whatever they put inside of it is the action that's going to get repeated. And usually there's a, a place where they can click a drop down menu and choose how many times to repeat that. So they've, at this point, they've learned how to use the repeat block, which in programming is something that gets used a lot. It keeps you from writing the same code over and over and having programming code that's this long. It teaches them how to be concise. Tell, give it the directions in as few uh, moves as possible. So are you starting to connect that to things you do in other subjects? So here they have to decide what the pattern is and how to put the algorithm together so that the zombie, which is very popular right now, they love the zombies, so that the zombie gets to the flower. On a lot of these activities where you know that there's a pattern to this, but if you see a repeat block as one of their choices, you know there's a pattern. So we start talking about patterns in class. Have you done patterns before? Like red, blue, red, blue, or red, red, blue, red, red, blue. One, three, one, three. You know, patterns. They, they're familiar with patterns. They do that all of the time. So when we start doing activities that are patterns using a repeat block, this is where I tell them, I don't want 